MDL Marina's South Coast and Green Tech Boat Show, guided by Ray Marine. It's ideal, and I'm really pleased that MDL chose to combine the Green Tech and the South Coast Boat Show. The Green Tech attracts people who are already interested in the green technologies. The South Coast Boat Show attracts more traditional buyers, and they can now see that what we can provide green technologies that will also do what you want to do in a boat. So you don't have to be in that absolute niche part of the market to be interested in the green technologies now. The MDL management team really understand that if they're going to keep their marinas full, they've got to have people that don't just buy boats, but engage and enjoy their boats. And they've really taken that on. And boat shows are not just about looking at buying boats. They're about looking at boats and getting the understanding of the marina. And here we can see all the sort of ancillary chandlery companies and other companies that get involved with it. And it's very good they've got them here. So people understand the whole picture. The visitors have come and been very impressed. Certainly the layout of the show, it forms a really nice kind of atmosphere. That partnership works both ways for us. So for us, it's about supporting MDL, it's about supporting the marine industry as a whole and for them obviously we've helped with the marketing and being part of the show and the organising. I'm really looking forward to for this show is that it's going to be a lot of like-minded people interested in this innovation and collaborating and sharing ideas and showing examples of what we're doing obviously with our pixie boats but then everybody else who's got something useful to bring to the front of our mind. We're really excited about going to the show, showing off what we've created and talking to visitors all day long about the tech that we've created and how it would work within their environment. We need open platforms, we need the networking, we need people to work together and share ideas and share the vision for what is a sustainable future for boating. So it's an excellent achievement to uh, the MDL team. It's going to be a great show. MDL have been fantastic about setting this up and really bringing everyone together and really highlighting the importance that we need to start being more sustainable, protecting the waters that we depend on for our livelihoods, our well-being and enjoyment. And having this show, having been such a success, is really bringing everyone together for this common cause and showcasing what can be achieved. Hello and welcome to This Marina Life with me, Kerry Herford jones at MDL Marinas. Today's episode is all about the MDL South Coast and Green Tech boat shows taking place from the 21st to the 23rd of April this year. This event brings together both power and sail brands, along with new innovative eco-friendly products, all at the same great venue. With over 70 new boats to explore, this is an ideal opportunity for serious buyers who want to experience a high quality range of boats in stunning surroundings. Now in its third year of existence, the Green Tech Boat Show will also be held at MDL's Ocean Village Marina, where it plays centre stage as part of the South Coast Boat Show. It's the part of the show that boat owners will want to visit in order to see how the revolution that's taking place in their work and home environments are reflected in their leisure time. In this episode, we'll hear from MDL's Sales and Marketing Director Tim Mayer about the show itself. And you'll also hear from some of those exhibiting, including Steve Bruce from ePropulsion Technologies, Kate Fortnum, the RYA's Green Blue Campaign Manager, and David Kendall from Optima Projects Limited. I opened my chat with Tim by asking him why MDL have amalgamated what were two very successful but separate shows together in a new venue at the same time. So by bringing the two shows together, we just felt we were in a better position to help boat owners and prospective boat owners understand the green options available to them. I think when we started the Green Tech Boat Show in 2020, green technology really was a separate conversation. But now those conversations have merged and in essence green technology and the electric boats now seem to be much more part of the mainstream. So hopefully by bringing the two shows together, we'll be able to get a much bigger audience which helps push the movement and change at a much faster rate. Now, you've had the South Coast Boat Show previously at Ocean Village Marina. Clearly, this is a marina that lends itself to this kind of event. Yeah, absolutely. The location, I'm probably slightly biased, but I think it's probably one of the best locations in the UK to host a boat show. It's really easy to get to. Parking is exceptionally easy and incredibly good value for money. There's loads of bars and restaurants around the show, as well as having food and beverage options within the show as well. So it's got something for everybody. The event's taking place from the 21st to the 23rd of April. What time's the day and how much is it to get in, Tim? 
Well, the best news is it costs absolutely nothing to get in at all. The show starts at 10 in the morning and finishes at 6 o'clock in the evening. But during each day of the show, there is also an innovation hub. So members of the public can go and listen to industry experts from generally half past 10 to 11 in the morning all the way through to close. Let's talk a little bit about some of those talks and demonstrations because you really have got some exceptional speakers taking place, haven't you? Absolutely, we have. Across every single day of the three-day event, there's something exciting to go and hear. Just as a brief example, on at 2.30 on Friday the 21st, there is the Future of Boating panel discussion, which is an industry expert Q&A and discussion. There'll be Sarah Fia from the University of Plymouth, who is a leading light amongst clean maritime and decarbonisation. We've got John Partridge, who's the CEO of RS Electric Boats. There's Rory, the CEO of Vita, which is a marine technology company that develops all electric powertrains and also has some electric boats. Um, we've also got Jamie Marley, who's an impartial electric and hybrid marine propulsion consultant, and uh, Wayne Peters, who's from the North Devon Marine Project, and he concentrates on clean energy development and has done this around the, 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 both sort of land and sea projects. And we've also got Kate Fortnum, who's a campaign manager for Railways Green Blue, and she looks at identifying key environmental issues and environmental best practice. So that is one example of a really good panel discussion which people can go to completely free of charge and listen to her how experts are leading the industry to a much greener place. What can visitors expect to see when they visit? So there's a really nice land side this year, which has got 43 exhibitors across the land. Half of that is all dedicated to green tech. The other half is your, your normal sort of marine and ancillary products. On the pontoons, there's 76 boats that we've got now. So whether you're into multi hulls, there is, I think, three or four different types of trimaran, as well as about five or six different types of catamaran. There's a lot of power boats in various guises and sizes, and obviously a lot of sail boats as well. So as I say, there is something for everyone, and it's it's all in a really convenient place to see them next to a harbour hotel. You've also got something quite interesting happening in terms of the Green Innovator Award presentation. Tell us a little bit about that. We have. So the Green Innovator Award, we started it in 2022. E-Propulsion won it in 2022, and I'm really pleased to say that actually for 2023, E-Propulsion are now sponsoring the Innovation Award sorry, the Innovator Award as well as the Innovation and the Press and Preview Day. But essentially, this award distinguishes products and services that we would class as pioneering in sustainability, innovation and design. It's aimed at product projects both from startups as well as established companies, and we're trying to highlight suppliers who make a special effort towards the environmentally sustainable practices, products or services. Nominations are open now, so people can just nominate who they'd like to win via the EDL Boat Show website. And I think so far, nominations, to be fair, have come in some really quite astounding numbers so it should be a really really good thing to go and see and you can see that in the innovation hub on saturday when we hand out the award and i think it's about 12 or one o'clock that's going to be quite something you must be very proud and pleased to actually have and to be hosting something like that I think it's brilliant and you know we're definitely pleased that we're hosting it and we're pleased that it's getting traction but I think really the key bit is it's really good to recognise the companies, the sort of change makers, the people that are really leading the way in changing technology. So what about yourself Tim, what are you looking forward to particularly over the course of the three days? I think that there is no doubt that the show is obviously take an awful lot of time to organise it's an awful lot of work to put in but the the whole show it's just great to organise it so I don't think there's anything one particular thing that stands out but we're certainly looking forward to welcoming all the exhibitors in. Seriously looking at some of the lineup of some of the names here this is really representative of the very best not just the UK but from all over the world of people wanting to exhibit here. I think it's fair to say any type of leisure boat from sort of the more affordable models up to the luxury and we've got something that sits there so yeah we're really pleased we've got representation from most of the countries that are involved in this industry and certainly representation from a lot of the really popular brands as well as some of the more niche brands as well so yeah it's going to be fantastic headline sponsor again this year i see ray marine have decided to come on board once more they're clearly getting a lot out of this partnership yeah, but it's great to have the support from Raymarine. Raymarine sponsored it for the previous three years and actually they've not just signed up for 2023 but have signed up to be the headline sponsor going all the way through into 2025. So it's a real kudos for the show and obviously Raymarine on the side of that. But they obviously do really well out of it and get to talk to all the exhibitors and all the members of the public. They're a really great support to the show and we're grateful to have them. So let's just look at actually booking then. You say it's free to get in, but clearly there's a booking system to not only book a free ticket, but also to view a boat 
and have a look around the virtual show online. You can do so. I think that this show really is designed for boat buyers and people with a genuine interest in the show. And because of that, there are two ways of booking. You can book yourself a free ticket via the website, which will give you access to the show. But if actually you are interested in taking a deeper look at some of the boats and really getting some time with the dealers, you can also click the viewer boat tab. That takes you through to the virtual show, and it's at that point you can then book appointments to see any of the brands that you want to. Oxen are uh, exhibiting for the first time this year, so if you wanted to see those boats, you'd go through on viewer boat, click on their brand, and then you can choose the time of day that you want to go and see the dealer, which is great because it essentially means you haven't got to sit in big queues while people are going through the boats, then to only find the dealers talking to someone else you can book the exact time you want and have a dedicated hour space with them that's really nice because it is about quality time i think i can describe this show as a fairly intimate show it's got a closeness to it but lots to see lots to do i presume you're going to advise people that actually one day might not be enough yeah i think that's a fair comment it's as i said it, it is definitely designed for those that are seriously looking at either purchasing now or in the relatively near future and that's why we've got such a high quality range of boats on display but as i say they, they should take advantage of a booking system book appointments to see the different brokers but there's no better time is there? if you're thinking of buying a new vessel than actually getting to see all the models displayed next to each other but not only that get to book an hour slot with each of the dealers to make sure that you get all the time you need to make an informed decision for you and your family yeah, good point. And most importantly, there's a chance to win over £2,000 worth of equipment from Ray Marine. There is, absolutely. If you get your ticket, you'll go into the prize draw. And then at Ray Marine, we, we normally draw the draw the winner out a week or two after the show. Last year, I think there was 12 winners in total. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a really good prize draw and something people should get involved with. Wonderful. Tim Mayer, looking forward to the show immensely. I know you are, I know I will be as well, but we need to say something, as you mentioned there earlier, this sort of event doesn't happen by itself. There's a great team of people. Do you want to take the opportunity to perhaps say a few words to those that are involved in this great project? Yeah, I guess thank you doesn't really cover it because the nice thing is I get to come and speak to people like you and plug it while they do all the work for us. But I, I think it's one thing, person we haven't mentioned and is probably worth picking up on is the Ocean Youth Trust who were at the show last year. They're going to be at the show this year. The Ocean Youth Trust are quite a special charity. MDR Marinas sponsor them and essentially they help disadvantaged people generally but essentially get into boating and into sailing. They have a 30 metre long vessel which will be on one of the hammerheads at the show. It's it's called prolific people are welcome to go on board see what they do see how they help people see what they do to get people into this wonderful hobby of ours and as i say definitely worth seeing the global sales director of e-propulsion technology steve bruce is up next the company was started by four friends at the hong kong university of science and technology in 2012 and is now regarded as the market leader in its sector I asked Steve how important it was for his company to exhibit at the South Coast and Green Tech boat shows. From my perspective, I think it's very important because obviously this market is emerging, but it's emerging at a rapid rate of knots. People have got a lot of questions. Those questions need answering properly to, in order to help those people make that decision to transition to electric. How revolutionary is it what you produce? It's not really revolutionary, in fairness. And, you know, I mean, electric motors were around in this country really before diesel motors were, you know, but I think battery technology certainly has moved on since yeah. then. And uh, we are in the fortunate position that we now have our own battery packing facility. So actually for custom projects, we can make the right battery, the right shape, the right size for that project. Let's talk about some of the e-propulsion units that you offer to the domestic sailor, the domestic motorboater. I'm thinking particularly in terms of outboards. What's the sort of range that people can look at? So on the outboards, we've got a little one kilowatt motor, which is a useful replacement if you were previously thinking, you know, up to sort of four horsepower petrol outboard. And then we've got our larger Navy series, the three and the six kilowatt motors, which again are good for heavier boats, uh, you know, two to three tons for the three, four to five tons for the six is quite realistic. And, and again, that's boats up to sort of 30, 35 feet displacement, semi-displacement type applications. And then uh, more recently, just last year, we actually launched our inboard series, which is now offering a direct replacement for your diesel inboard. 
Speaking personally, my wife is very excited by the idea of e-propulsion outboard because of the weight, massive change in weight between a four horsepower, two horsepower and an e-outboard. But the price differential is still pretty strong, isn't it? Certainly you would pay more up front, but if you actually look at the total cost of ownership, it can quite often come out on top. Because if you're buying a new combustion motor now, a brand new one, and you want to have a warranty with that, then you've got to have it serviced every year. Those servicing, you know, £150-£200 a year. So very quickly, the money that you saved on buying the petrol outboard can get eaten up by those costs. And that's assuming that everything goes fine with it. You know, the reality is that we hear more and more with the increased ethanol content of fuel that's causing more problems for outboards. So over and above the, uh, the servicing, you have to maintain a warranty. There's additional work getting done when carburetors are getting gummed up and the like, and that's another couple of hundred quid spent. So before you know it, actually, you know, spending a little bit of extra up front, it could have saved you a lot of time and money and hassle in the long run. Yeah, some good points you make there. And that you've just added that whole thought process now into our decision making. So thanks for that, Steve. Let's look a bit more detail about those batteries. You've mentioned there that you're producing now some bespoke ones that fit into space. But clearly there's ones that you're buying from the commercial sector. Reliability has just come on leaps and bounds over the last few years. And of course, the distance you can now travel on one charge. Absolutely, yeah. So more and more applications are opening up for that reason batteries you know at the end of the day are an integral part of the total solution so you need to offer that as part of it in order to ensure you get the maximum efficiencies everything's about gaining efficiencies you know one or two percent here one or two percent there it all adds up to a much better solution than the and yes you know the, with the the battery technology we tend to focus on of course is also is lfp lithium ferrophosphate because that is un undoubtedly the safest answer and that's backed up by the insurance company's attitudes to towards that as well. My understanding now is that battery installed by a manufacturer approved installer, the there is no impediments to you at all. In fact, if anything, there might be some advantages because they can see that that is uh, in several ways safer than diesel was. What's the market going to look like in the next five years, do you think, Steve? Good question. That is <laughs> that is hanging a bit of seaweed out the window stuff in some ways, isn't it? it, it you know, from my point of view, again, obviously we're conscious of the fact that the things going on in the world are going to have some sort of a negative effect on the leisure market. But the commercial market is coming on leaps and bounds. Obviously, with, with the technology that we're offering now, small work boats are, are a viable thing. And if you look at the way the boating is changing, even leisure boating, there's more and more tourist type stuff and pay to play type applications as opposed to the old model of you buy it you look after it with that in mind uh, there are also more electrification opportunities for boats that are being used in that way so a balanced view is it's not going to be easy but i actually still think there's progress to be made what are the issues do you think boat owners are facing when they try to reduce their impact on the environment steve it's getting clear information, isn't it? You know, because taking something in isolation doesn't necessarily come up with the right answer. You've got to look at it completely holistically. So it's not just about electric propulsion per se. If you need generators, you've got to think about how do you do that? Anti-fouling, designing the hull to be efficient in the first place for, you know, for that application. All of these things have got to change. Once upon a time, the answer was quite easily let's just throw more power at the problem that'll make the problem go away that can't be the answer we've got to come up with better answers than that so it's it's looking at every single aspect of the vessel's design and where we can make those improvements and of course electric propulsion is a big part of that but it's not the whole answer and of course shows like this are important for you to hear what boat owners are thinking and feeling i suppose Exactly that. I'm keen to understand what questions people are asking. Those questions are changing over time. A lot of people, for a lot of the time, the question was always about cost and the range capabilities. As more people are getting their heads around the fact that actually the costs are becoming comparable, true cost of ownership, and ranges are capable for many displacement, semi-displacement type applications, as I say, then more of that will come. This is your opportunity of your sales pitch, Steve. 
what's the difference between e-propulsion and others in the marketplace? Because there are quite a few to choose from what we're looking at. Yeah, there are. Certainly, if you go to something like METS now, there must have been two dozen different companies there that are you know, telling you about a solution that they're working on. I, I suppose the difference with e-propulsion is, yes, we're only a young company, but we've established ourselves quite firmly in that time. So now we have a global network of distributors and dealers who are capable of looking after you wherever you wander off to in your boat. And we have a broad range of products that can specifically suit your application rather than trying to put a square peg in a round hole. And we offer a complete solution. So we have the capability and we have the supply chain to ensure that we can look after our customers going going forward. And I, and I suppose that kind of puts us in, in a pole position there. So people coming to the show in April, what can they expect to see on the e-propulsion stand, Steve? We'll have a variety of the products that we offer on there, so you can get a feel for the different systems and the different voltages. And of course, we'll have people there that you can ask questions. There are no stupid questions. And, and, <laughs> Thank and, goodness for that. <laughs> and just get to understand what would be a suitable system for your application. Yeah, you want to hear, as we said earlier, you want to hear about their boat, their challenges. There's also this issue, of course, around recharging. Most modern boats now, you can relatively work on the basis you can recharge a outboard battery on board. But when you're looking at integrated electric motors in the boat itself, and it's the main source of propulsion, how is that issue being addressed, do you think? So there's several ways. In actual fact, that nothing really needs to change because if you look at most of the systems that we supply for smaller leisure vessels up to, say, you know, 40, 50 feet, which covers a fair chunk of the market, then your normal shore power supply that you would have in a marina is more than enough to charge that battery overnight in a typical application. And then when you add to that hydro regeneration, which we offer in all of our ranges now, on the larger motors, again, that can be quite significant. You know, so if you're sailing along at six, seven knots, you're putting free power back into your battery. And then, of course, for two weeks in the summer, the solar works as well. And that regenerative power that we're talking about there, that's evolved quite quickly, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. As we learn more and more, it's always a bit of a balancing act between, you know, propulsion and regeneration and, you know, what is it we're really looking to, to achieve here. And then, of course, there's the, the black art of propellers and uh, that yeah. you can get into there. So there's no one right. It's a considered decision every single time as to what's the right way to go. But it doesn't have to be complicated because we do provide the relevant propeller for the relevant size vessel in that application yeah, you know so if you've got a sailboat that happily cruises at seven knots then we'll supply you with a motor and a propeller that maximizes the regen at seven knots you know? and those can be quite quite good numbers and especially as we find ourselves getting more into catamaran world where those boats can easily comfortably achieve the higher cruising speeds the regen capability is a massive part of the overall calculations for hotel loads who's going to be at the green tech and south coast boat show stand i I intend to be around most of the time although i might be doing my usual trick of wandering around talking to other people but i'll always be available (laughs) to come to the stand and certainly members of our team will be there as well chris our sales manager will certainly be on call let's now hear from kate fortnum the rya's green blue campaign manager Kate manages not only the Environmental Awareness Programme for the Royal Yachting Association, but also for British Marine. Its primary aim is to raise awareness of how boat users, clubs, centres and businesses can be more environmentally friendly. I asked Kate how her environmental campaigning was going. It's been fantastic over the last few years, the interest from the recreational boating community in the environment and actually wanting to have a positive impact has grown substantially. Very much in the early days, it was the Green Blue going to the boating community and raising awareness and encouraging change, whereas now the demand, we're getting several phone calls, emails every day from the community asking for ways that they can be more sustainable on board, whether that's choosing more sustainable anti-foulings or how they can minimise their plastic pollution. So yeah, it's been really, really positive and it's a really exciting time. Well, you're right at the cutting edge of it in many ways, Kate. So let's just talk now for this show particularly 
is the issues that most boaters face on a daily basis really is how can they make their boating greener and what sort of issues they face when they try and mitigate their impact on the environment. Yeah, so we cover a wide variety of different environmental issues and ways that boaters can help have a positive impact on our environment. Some of the key topic areas that we're focusing on at the moment is decarbonisation of vessels. So that's in line with reducing carbon emissions to help tackle climate change. We're also looking at anti-fouling and trying to reduce the water pollution around that and discovering new innovative technologies to support boat users in in choosing a more sustainable option. We're also looking at waste, especially around end of life of vessels, because we've got a lot of our boats now coming to the end of their life. And what can we do with them in terms of recycling? And do we have enough facilities to enable that to happen? In terms of challenges, I think there's a lot of the simple things that boaters can still do that will have a big impact. And every time I go and speak to boaters at clubs, centres or in the community, I always say there's these very small things that we can do in terms of our in terms of our behaviour when we're out on the water that will have a big impact. There are other areas which will require possibly a little bit more time, a bit more budget to enable to happen. And it's about making this balance between, yes, we're not going to be able to do absolutely everything straight away, but we can start putting in these these small changes. And what we're trying to do is go and talk to the boating industry and find out what solutions are available and how can we make it practical and affordable for boat users to adopt these going forwards. It must be quite frustrating sometimes, though, from your point of view, is that it's difficult to actually quantify and qualify the difference that the campaign is actually making. Sometimes, yes, it can be. I mean, obviously, what we do is we look at how much awareness raising that we're doing, how many people attend our talks, events, how many of our guides and information we're disseminating, how many visits we're getting to the website. So we're getting a clear idea that there's a definite increase in interest. And what we're also finding now is boat users are not just ringing up or contacting us to find out some of the basic things they can do they're now wanting the details that really shows us that they're actually wanting to take action so for example whereas it might be in the past of oh yeah that that sounds interesting we'll look into maybe electrifying our vessel and then it's kind of left now it's okay what kind of options are there available what's the equivalent horsepower for what's on an electric outboard can you tell me the different manufacturers how much is this going to cost will it be suitable for these conditions and that's telling us they want to start taking that extra step and making action which is positive from our side. You mentioned there earlier about the disposal of, of old boats and that's a becoming a bigger and bigger issue looking around the yards around the UK. Are there some solutions in the offing there, Kate? Um, so the RWA and British Marine are doing a lot of work behind the scenes. So the sustainability manager at the RWA sits on the European Boating Association because this is not just an issue in the UK. And it's not just an issue in terms of just the boating sector, because we're looking at trying to recycle composite materials here, where boats are made from different materials and trying to separate those out to make recycling. Currently in the UK, there's only sort of maybe between three and four recycling centres for boats. So that's where boat users can take their vessels and they will break those down for them. Unfortunately, we still have that issue where there are composite materials in those and they do end up going to landfill. So there's a lot of work happening at the moment and research by universities about how they can separate those composites out, which has been achieved on a small scale. Now what needs to happen is that needs to be upscaled and more facilities across the UK need to be provided. One area with this, obviously, the difficulties from the boat user's perspective is if your boat comes to the end of, it li- end of its life and you want to recycle it, it does cost money. And sometimes it may be more affordable to leave that boat on a mooring or within an estuary. And unfortunately, then the harbour authorities have to find a way of disposing that. Yes, and you're seeing quite a bit of that at the top end of the itching at the moment, aren't you? But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's happening in various locations and it's really getting a grasp of the data and identifying how large is this issue. Because although there might be a lot of end of life vessels, some of them are actually sort of DIY projects for individual people and some of them may be in yes. people's back gardens, for example. <laughs> One thing that France is doing, for example, is they do have more recycling units across the country, I think around about 20 And what they've done there is the cost of providing those facilities is 
being put on the manufacturers and then essentially whoever's buying the vessel at first point of purchase and then that goes into supplying it rather than it being the end user which is usually the person that's least likely to yes, afford yes. the disposal but there's ongoing discussions still with that but that's what France are doing and it, it may be an option that could be implemented here in the UK. The Green Tech Boat Show coming up now combined with the South Coast Boat Show both happening in April what is the theme of your stand for this particular show Kate? Similar to last year really we're focusing on the protection of seabed habitats because the Green Blue and the RWA has been involved in a four-year now five-year project called the Life Recreation Remedies Project and it's looking at restoring and protecting seabed habitats such as seagrass. So what we're doing is we're there on our stand to talk to boat users about about seagrass and these habitats, but what they can do in terms of sustainable anchoring and also more sustainable advanced mooring systems. So that's new technology that's been developed and trialled in five sites in the south of England as part of this project. And we will have a life-size example of an advanced mooring system for visitors to look at. And it's a great opportunity also to talk to other boating businesses who may wish to implement these and actually install them in their waters. Are any of those mooring systems actually already in place and in use? Yes, so in terms of the project, there are some advanced mooring systems in Yarmouth off the north coast of Cowes in the Solent Maritime. There's some down in Corsan Bay in the Plymouth. And also there are some at Studland, I think around 11, that boat folk marinas have put in place there. And these mooring systems essentially are designed to minimise the impact on the seabed. So removing the traditional sort of swing and abrasion of the chain but also the size of the anchoring block that rests on the seabed and this is all essentially to help boaters continue accessing the beautiful bays and coves that we like to go to that are sheltered from weather conditions but as we know these are also ideal locations for these types of habitats such as seagrass so in order for us to coexist and ensure we're minimising our impact, we need to find technologies like this and, and start implementing them. And Studland's a really prime example with a lot of conversation having gone on in that particular area with areas not available for anchoring, trying to stop people from anchoring there. And mm. lovely that actually there's some solutions being put in place rather than just, no, you can't come here. Yeah, exactly. So it's more looking at voluntary no anchor zones because there's still an understanding that boaters still need to access some of these points because of sort of health and safety reasons. But it allows boat users to understand and have an education, educational point of view of this is the boundary where the seagrass is and if preferable to anchor outside of those. But in some situations, boat, boats do need to go in further and this is where the advanced mooring systems enable us to still access these points in, instead of using anchoring or the traditional swing moorings that we have as an alternative option. People coming along for the three days of the show be able to come along and see you. Who else is going to be on the stand with you this year? So we'll be joined by partners from the Remedies Project. So we'll have Marine Conservation Society, Natural England representatives, Ocean Conservation Trust. So yeah, it's a really great time where all these organisations are all coming together for a common cause and trying to help the boating community play an important role in, in protecting our habitats so yeah there'll be lots of lots of people to come and chat to and we're also going to be delivering a couple of talks so there is a panel discussion i believe on the friday of the event where we're going to be discussing electric propulsion and there'll be experts on that panel that boat users can come and visit and listen to and then on the saturday myself natural england and the Marine Conservation Society and the actual Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust will be delivering a talk on the Remedies Project and all about that sustainable anchoring and mooring systems. Wow, that's going to be quite a show. And um, it's good to know you've had plenty of notice to get prepared for that, Kate. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. And and last year at the show, it was really, really popular. And we're looking forward to chatting to more boat users And it's a real hot topic at the moment, especially around seagrass as an important habitat to tackle climate change, as well as tackling pollution and coastal erosion. So I do welcome everyone to come along and have a listen, learn some environmental top tips from us, things that you can adopt on board. But also if you want some more technical information, then this is the place to go because you've got all the different exhibitors 
that are demonstrating the latest green technology in the recreational boating sector. So great opportunity to have it all there in one place to do a bit of research and, and knowledge gain. That sounds like a good enough reason to me to go along to the show. But from your point of view, what else are you looking forward to at the show yourself, Kate? From our point of view, it's a great opportunity to do networking, really. I'm going to talk to trade businesses and find out what the latest technology is. I mean, we're still learning a lot about what's out there. And there's some great companies producing some really innovative products. And if we're able to find out what those are, we can then communicate those out to the boating community and share that knowledge out further afield, which is one of the key aims of the Green Blue. And also catching up with with friends from companies, organisations and also boat users, which we, we see returning year on year. So a great opportunity and uh, it's good that MDL are making it happen. MDL have been fantastic about setting this up and really bringing everyone together and really highlighting the importance that we need to start being more sustainable, protecting the waters that we depend on for our livelihoods, our well-being and enjoyment. And having this show, having been such a success, is really bringing everyone together for this common cause and showcasing what can be achieved. Finally, I got to talk to David Kendall, an aeronautical engineer by training who has more recently been designing all sorts of composite structures. Boats have been a big part of his life, from wind farm boats to military boats and hovercraft, from foiling to race boats and even America Cup projects. His company, Optima Projects Limited, have a very big story to tell and a very impressive boat to show. I began by asking David how much he was looking forward to the boat shows in April. This will be our first public unveiling of the boat. And we exhibited at the show last year, but just with a shore side stand and a small display model of the boat. That was good because it gave us a lot of feedback from both public and industry. So it's helpful. But this will be the first time we've exhibited the actual boat. So it will be very exciting. The boat itself, the understatement of the year is that it's exciting to look at. It looks revolutionary. It's so appealing to the eye. I'm, I'm being a bit biased here. But it looks something different to anything else on the market at the moment. Would you agree? I think if the only concept we could come up with was exactly the same with, you know, as what else was on the market, then to be honest, we wouldn't have done it. You know, if, if we didn't have anything fresh to bring to the market, we had no desire to just go out there and compete with the masses. I've never really done that in my, in my sort of career. I've always been looking for different angles, different ways of doing things, better ways of doing things. And it was partly sort of born out of frustration that there's not more innovation out there. And I I love boats, I love the marine industry, but we were just increasingly sort of frustrated with the direction we saw it going in, which was all the big players just sort of converging into producing something very similar to each other. Occasionally you do see something new. I mean, you know, when things like Axapar came out, they came out with something that looked very different bit marmite some people loved it some people hated it i quite like them but they were brave in doing something different and been unbelievably successful and now have what half a dozen direct copies pretty much which i guess they should take as a compliment but yes we very much wanted to do something different and it was a style that i liked personally you know it's got some retro influences it's got ultra modern technology it's got a totally revolutionary hull form and it all sort of merged together and I think it's been really interesting how we could sort of combine these different influences and and the feedback has been amazing on on the looks and the styling I think people are ready for something different so it looks great stunning to the eye it's about the technology underneath the skin of course so let's talk a little bit about that and let's also talk about if you like the Achilles heel of anything with electrical propulsion, the batteries. So talk us through the thinking and where you've ended up with that. Yeah, we wanted to produce something that was more environmentally friendly. And that was criteria number one. But we also wanted something that we could genuinely use and go cruising and go proper trips and go from UK to France or Monaco to Corsica or you know, proper distances, which you just cannot do in an electric boat at the moment. I mean, it's just not an option. And everyone's sort of saying it it won't be an option, it can't be done. And battery limitations are part of that. 
and batteries are improving all the time. We certainly didn't want to be a battery company and we didn't want to reinvent things that we didn't need to reinvent or we'd be another five years away from production. So we looked out to the market as what were the best batteries out there and the best systems, which includes performance, weight, safety, was high on our list. And we buy our batteries from a, a company in Austria called Kreisel. And they also supply all the Exshore boats and other boats and commercial vehicles. Their batteries are very, very well developed. They are completely flooded with a an oil-based fire suppressing coolant so the cells are actually sort of flooded they're not just around the casing and thermal management of batteries is absolutely crucial Um, anybody who drives an electric car will really notice the drop in range over the winter when it's really cold and also if it gets really hot then you either lose range or you lose charging capability so thermal management of batteries is very very important and With the the oil-based cooling system around the batteries, we have the ability to to cool the batteries, which is via a seawater heat exchanger. Ah. You also have the ability to heat the batteries. If you're in sort of Scandinavia countries, you know, where you're sub-zero, you actually need to heat the batteries to, to get them into their operating window. This is really innovative stuff. You move that whole technology into the world of battery management. How innovative is that? A lot of it's borrowed from electric vehicles, cars, you know, which are very highly developed now. So again, we're more than happy to sort of take technology from those sort of industries and transfer it into the marine industry. And on the boat, we have a, a 22 kilowatt AC charger, which will charge anything. You could plug it into a 13 amp plug. You could plug it into a three phase 32 kilowatt, 32 amp supply to give you 22 kilowatts. That's an automotive component, and that's also liquid cooled. The thermal management of all the chargers is also very important. So some of those bits of tech, you know, they are so well developed in the automotive industry. There is no need to change them. You know, they work extremely well on the boat. You talk about a hundred mile range in your blurb. Is is that a, a realistic figure? Is that a target, or is that a minimum? Hundred is very realistic. Flat water, no wind, 200. You know, in theory, the boat would do 200 miles at displacement speeds of sort of seven knots. It's, and we've got to be really careful when we do talk about range because you need to have reserves, you need to have safety margins, as you would with petrol or diesel. You know, you'd normally keep sort of 20% reserve when you talk about range. So we need some level playing fields, really, of how we talk about range. Because there is a great temptation to say, oh, my boat can do 30 miles, 40 miles, which it may do, flat calm, no waves, no wind. And then you go somewhere for lunch and you find you can't come back because the wind's picked up. And that's why we, we really developed the boat to have a, a very long range. You know, in theory, it's 200 miles so that we have all those safety margins. We also don't have to completely deplete the batteries, which isn't good for the battery health. You generally want to operate the batteries between sort of 20% and 80%, as you should with a car. But I've talked to other EV owners who don't realise this, and they're charging their car up to 100%. It's not not healthy. You can do it when you need to, but you don't want to be doing it all the time. So we really developed the boat to have this very large range of 200 miles. Sure, not many people are going to be doing 200-mile trips in one go. Um, But it means we could very safely go, you know, from the Solent to Cherbourg or Channel Islands or Monaco over to Corsica or from Mallorca to mainland Spain. Those sort of journeys, which are just not an option at the moment with with electric boats. The boat show is a real showcase for you to really show her off to the wider public. What's been the public reaction so far? It's been amazing. I mean, I think everyone is waiting to see the boat in the water and see that it can actually do everything we say it can do and that's why we had to build the prototype we started off with you know sort of computer designs and renderings and things which look absolutely stunning i was always really worried that you know would the actual boat live up to the renderings because you see it with sort of you know concept cars and things they never look as good as the designs but it has at the moment we've built a 10 meter boat 
And it's a lot harder to get a smaller boat looking really good than a, than a larger boat. And 10 metres will be the, the baby of the range. We, we don't expect to go smaller than that. And the technology that we've developed and the hull form that we've developed is about as small as it really works very well. And having the load carrying capability to carry you know, a good number of people and all the batteries and everything else. The feedback has been pretty amazing. And I think everyone really welcomes the fact that it's fresh and it's new and it's it's not another white caravan if you like there's definitely a place for that and there's a really place for sort of low cost mass produced boats but we've been trying to produce something a little bit different with a new style and it's got a lot of brand identity as well so this show is absolutely perfect for you then it's ideal and i'm really pleased that mdl chose to combine the green tech and the south coast boat show because the green tech attracts people who are already involved, you know, interested in, in the green technologies. South Coast Boat Show attracts more traditional buyers. And they can now see that, well, we can provide green technologies that will also do what you want to do in a boat. So you don't have to be in that absolute niche part of the market to, to be interested in the green technologies now. And a little bit like an electric car, you may be paying a bit of a premium to, to have that option. But then your running costs will be between 5 and 10% of the cost of running a petrol or diesel boat. And the difference is huge. So b- particularly helpful for boats that are used a lot, be that privately or in boat clubs or commercial applications, where they're clocking up a lot of hours, then the, the, the payback in terms of saving of running costs is phenomenal. And you know, we've seen increases in fuel costs, um, obviously that, that sort of swung it even further in, in our favour. The issue is going to be, and it is the same at sea as it is on land, where the heck do you go to get the thing charged up? Because let's face it, we're struggling on land, let alone at sea, to get that sorted. It's interesting because you know everyone thinks we're sort of 10 years behind the car industry in terms of electrification, which we are in terms of rollout of product. In terms of infrastructure, it's almost the reverse. We don't have charging infrastructure for cars. That's all being built and currently installed and it's desperately trying to catch up with the growth of EVs on the road. I I think the take-up of EVs has probably been faster than anybody realised, for good reason, and the infrastructure is desperately trying to play catch-up. With boats, it's a little bit different. If your boat is in a harbour or marina, 99.9% of those already have an electricity supply. And the boat will charge from a standard 16 amp supply. It will charge from anything. It has an intelligent shore connection which will detect what it's plugged into. So you plug it into a 16 amp supply, it won't overload it. You plug it into a 13, 32 amp supply, then it will double the charge rate. So it's very intelligent, very well sort of controlled. It would be nice for the marinas to push at those general shore supplies up to 32 amps, which isn't such a big ask. We're already seeing, particularly in some of the MDL marinas, roll out of DC superchargers from people like Aqua Superpower. Yeah, they exist in quite a few of the marinas already. So you've done all this work, you've got to this point. What's the next four, five, ten years look like for you and for your business, David? It's a very good question and it's a sort of question we're beginning to ask ourselves. This started off as purely a concept, as a study, really, bit of interest, bit of fun. What could we come up with something better than anyone else was doing? And then the more and more we looked at it, the better and better it looked. And then we're also very lucky that we had some government grants through Innovate UK and from Department of Transport. So it suddenly became much more serious. And then we're suddenly building a 10 metre boat. That's taken three years, that journey. And we've been very heads down getting the product right, getting the technology right. And now we're literally just about to launch the boat and do sea trials and check it all out. So we've stayed very much under the radar, or certainly under the public radar so far. We've got a list of people who'd like to buy boats. We've not accepted any orders because we we want to know exactly what we're going to build, how we're going to build it, what it's going to cost before we start taking people's money. There are a few who would probably like to give us some orders and some money (laughs) Um, which is good it's a good problem to have but it's still a still a challenge 
So now this year, once we got the prototype finished, is all about how we turn this from an R&D project into a commercial project and start building boats, rolling them out at the right quality, at the right cost, and, and delivering them to customers. So we, we need to think about how we're going to do that and whether we're going to do that on our own, with investment, with other backers, or whether we're going to do it in collaboration with other companies, partners, and we're really open-minded as to how that happens. The main thing is that it, it will happen. It has to happen because the industry needs it to happen. So the, the market and the opportunity is, is worldwide. We've got to figure out how to address it. And, and as a spin-off from this, we're now also looking at some commercial applications. I mean, it started off as 100% a leisure boat. Um, and then we started looking at things like the water taxi market. And we're, we're actually doing a study at the moment, which is, is partially funded by the Department of Transport, looking at a fleet of water taxis for the Solent. And this is also in conjunction with, with Red Funnel and with Forley Waterside. And for, Forley really changes the landscape because they're building a whole new town down at Forley and they desperately need water transport links and they want them to be clean. So there is a possibility of developing a, a fleet of, of water taxis, small ferries to service the, the whole of the Solent. You're starting to really push against open doors in many ways, David. We are, and it's a case of trying to decide which ones to go through because there's a whole line of doors open for us. As we reach the end of today's episode, David, I really would like you to, to share with us perhaps what visitors to your stand can expect when they come and see you at the Green Tech and South Coast Boat Show. Yeah, and we'll, we'll have our, our 10 metre prototype boat. We're just in the process of finishing fit out at the moment. The cabin will not be finished, I will warn everyone, so it may well be closed and for future public viewing. But the cockpit area will be finished. We will have done some sea trials. And at the moment, we're working with our propulsion partner, who is Rad Propulsion, who's another UK company, just doing the final installation of the propulsion system. So they'll probably have some guys at the show as well. So sort of certainly come and talk to us about the boat and, and talk to Rad about the, some of the propulsion systems. They're doing a, a 40 kilowatt electric outboard, which is quite revolutionary as well. Yeah. So we've, we've been working together on the two projects for the last three years. So we, yeah, we'll be at the show for the duration and really looking forward to seeing people. Whether you're potential buyers or just interested, want to understand a bit more about the technology, the limitations or, or lack of limitations. If you think there are limitations, come and talk to us because you may well find out that there's not. You know, be that charging or range or comfort or anything else. Thank you to all the guests who took part in this episode talking about the South Coast and Green Tech boat shows taking place at MDL's Ocean Village on the 21st, 22nd and 23rd of April. Don't forget to search MDL Marinas for your free tickets and I hope to see you there.